Let's now consider how to include categorical variables in linear models. So often in data, there are categorical variables. These are continuous. For example, if you look at data for salaries, you will probably have in the data things like the gender of the worker, which is male, female, qualifications of the worker as well, which could be high school, university, and so on. These are also categorical, along with other things, for example, like number of years of experience. So there will be continuous and categorical variables in the data. So how do we actually fit these into the linear model? Well, I was actually quite clever with this. So for example, is a very simple example. Let's take a look at the monthly income by age and gender. So define male is equal to 1, a variable that is called male, as 1 for a worker that's male, and 0 otherwise. And so male equals 0 indicates a female worker. The model equation here would be income is beta naught, our constant intercept, plus beta 1 times age, plus beta 2 times male. From the model equation here then, when male is equal to 1, the equation is male income is beta naught plus beta 1 age plus beta 2. And when male is 0, that means the income for a female is beta naught plus beta 1 age. So we can see the difference between these two equations is the beta 2. So beta 2 is the difference between the incomes of the males and females. If beta 2 is bigger than 0, that means males earn more than females. And if beta 2 is less than 0, then males earn less than females. So we don't require here a variable for males and one for females because simply the variable for males that I've got there defined takes care of both of those. So if I have to fit the model here, here's the data, and this is available or should be available in LMS. I've read the income data in this case. The head here shows you what the data looks like. I've got monthly income, the age, and this is age in tens of years. Male is one zero, and sex is male or female. So the way R works is I can either use male here, or I can use the string variable sex, the character variable sex, as long as it's defined as a factor. So you see, in my reading the table here, I have strings as factors, which means the sex will be read as a string variable, but as a factor, meaning it actually has levels males and females. I've chosen here to use male in my model. You can see how the output here. What it shows you from the model is that age isn't significant, only male is significant. And so from there, I can pick out that because the male coefficient here is positive, significant, that means males earn significantly more than females by 0.458, if this in hundreds of thousands, we can multiply by the scale factor. So here's the model equation. Income is equal to this. The p-value indicates male is significant. The coefficient of male being positive indicates that males have a high income on average the difference in males and females income is this much here in the appropriate units. As I said earlier, that means males actually earn more. So you can see it's simple to include categorical variables in the model, but there are a few things to watch out for. If you have categorical variables, as we had before, male and female for sex, or some other variables like education, maybe high school, tertiary, postgraduate, and so on, R can use those particular character variables as factors without having to convert to numerical variables. However, if the variables are numerical, if I have 1, 0, or if I have got education, for example, coded as 1, 2, 3, 4, then R will take them as numerical unless you coerce them and force them to become factors. We'll see how to do that later. Otherwise, you can use those categorical variables in R in the same way. Now, for categorical variables with two more levels. The first level in alphabetical order is taken as the base or reference level. And if it's numerical, the first, the lowest is taken as reference level. And the, the values or the coefficients at the other levels are estimated and they're in comparison to this reference level. We'll see exactly what this means when we fit models. 
in example, I've got just normal data here. So I've got X's rep. Understand how this means in the context of our R notes. Rep 3 to 6, so it's going 3, 4, 5, 6. The length is 30, so it repeats this 30 times. And I've got R norm here, N is the length of X. And uh, the mean is log of X plus 1, and the standard deviation is 1. So I'm generating normal data here, random normal data. The length is 30. The length of A is length of X here. The mean I've taken is log of X plus 1. And it's in the equation is equal to 1. And I've put in here just a, a model of y versus x. Here's a model. You can see that x is not significant. So here, as we saw earlier, the coefficient of x is 0.4187. And this means for a unit increase in x, the value of y will increase by 0.4187. However, suppose x is not numerical, but well, x, sorry, is not not just uh, continuous, but is in some way discrete, like the number of children, and y is the expense on toys. Now, the model as it stands in indicates that, on average, the cost of toys for a family of two children will be twice that for a family of one child. Not quite right, but essentially, if I increase the number of children by one, compared to increasing the number of children by two, then the increase in the sale, in the cost of or the expenses on toys is twice as much. And that's not reasonable. So what would be better is I'm gonna plot here while this is X, you can find it's not quite straight line or linear. What would be better is that if I could coerce X to be a factor, so simply X becomes factor X makes X into a factor. Now this is levels three, four, five, six. And if I then fit a linear model here of y versus x, we can see I've got the 4, 5, 6 appears. So the values of x are 3, 4, 5, 6. It's taking the lowest here as my reference level. And the other coefficients here are in comparison to x3. Oh, the three children. So here it means that compared to a family of three children, one of four children spends well, 2.2439, whatever the units are, less on toys. Compared to a family with three children, one with five children spends 0.6247 more on average. And compared to a family with three children, one with six children spends 0.78381 more on average. Now, I haven't looked at significances here. I'm not concerned with those yet. I'm just looking at what the model actually means as I have it. So you can see it will drop one level as a reference level and then give you coefficients for the other levels. And that's how it fits a categorical variable. And really the interest here is not in the actual means of these four levels I've got here, but the comparison between them, the difference between them. And that's why this is so beautifully done in this sense in R. So this slide just contains what I just said earlier. Now, let's look at transforming variables very quickly. There are some common functions we use. The first is the square function here, and it's inverse the square root function. So I hope you're all familiar with the square function. It just squares all the numbers, and the square root takes the square root of the numbers. The other two functions we'll look at, before we move on from there, of course, I've looked at square here only, but you could also take a look at cube and other powers as well. And not just square root, you could take a look at cube root and fourth root as well and other roots. Here is the next one, that's the exponential function. So this is exponential of x. This actually is raising this number called e to the power x. So I'm sure you all know something like 2 to the x, for example. So 2 to the 0 is always going to be 1. 2 to the 1 is 2. 2 squared is 4, and so on. This number e is a little special, and this function e to the x is a little special. That's why it's used in preference, usually, to other powers. So this is the function e to the x, and its inverse is the log function, which has a very similar shape to the square root function. So the exponential function is, again, similar to something like x squared, except it rises much faster. If I, if I put both x squared and e to the x on the same graph, you will find that e to the x will look more like this and be much more flatter. On the other hand, 
the log x is actually a lot flatter than the square root function. If I plot on this the square root function as well, you'll probably you'll find it'll be a lot more higher than that. And any other root for that matter, as long as it's a positive root, will be higher than the log function. So the log function is quite extreme in this sense. So why do we transform variables? Well, we are assuming here one of the assumptions of the linear model is that the residuals or the error terms are normal. But often they're skewed, and if they are skewed, that can be corrected sometimes by transforming the response variable. Here's an example. Look at the first one. This is the residual plot. So this shows that it is what's called a right skewed. Right skewed essentially means the tail goes to the right. A left skewed would be the opposite of that. So to correct this, what I'm going to do is I want to pull this tail inwards, and I can do that by looking at something like a log a square root, a cube root, those kinds of function. They pull the tail in. You can see the log function actually has overdone the thing. And now what I'm getting here is something that's left skewed. It's going to the other side. So the tail here goes to the right, that's right skewed. Here the tail goes to the left, it's left skewed. Square root seems to be okay. It does better than the log function. But cube root seems the best. This actually gives you a fairly symmetric histogram in the end. So, I've just said that. Now, the way it works is with things like the square root or log transformation is, if I've got data that looks like 4, 9, 16, 25, the square root gives me numbers that are 2, 3, 4, 5. So it pulls these numbers together, closer together. That's why something like this transformation corrects for right skewiness. Here is the opposite. I've got data that's left skewed. So here the tail goes towards the left here. And so I should be... I can't pull the tail in here, but I can take this tail out by looking at something like square or cube or exponential. So here, the square certainly is better than the original data. The cube is also fairly good. And exponential is also good. It's a choice between the cube or the exponential. Either will be good enough. They both look fairly good to me. I have chosen here the expression as the better model here. Sometimes the choice doesn't depend on quite what you think may be best, but it may depend on the context. So it might make sense to take the exponential of the variable. It might make sense to take the cube. Likewise, it might make sense to take the square root. It might make sense to take the log. So sometimes this choice is dictated to some extent by the context. So here you can see that transforming the response variable can correct for these issues with, with normality. The last part of this week's lecture is interactions. This is the last part, and I'll spend some more time on this. We'll stop here for this lecture. We'll come back for this last part in the next lectures. Thank you.